Hi, my name's Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, I'm going to be teaching you how to play Lisboa, designed by Vita Lacerda and published by Eagle Griffin Games. Lisboa is set in the latter half of the 18th century, and is about reconstructing the capital city of Portugal after a massive earthquake, followed by tsunami, and then three days of fires almost completely destroyed the city. During the game you will be helping the reconstruction and economic development of the new city, receiving graces from the king and the marquis, and working with the architects to build Lisboa anew. Many actions you'll take earn you wigs, which are the victory points in the game. The game of Lisboa is split into two time periods. Players take individual turns by playing a card from their hand and performing one of four main actions. You will build stores in the centre of the city, which will generate you wigs once the appropriate public buildings are opened, bringing customers to your stores. To open a public building requires help from one of the two architects, and a number of available public officials. You will also need influence in order to visit the nobles and gain their benefits. You can also trade with the nobles by giving them your goods, which can be produced once you have built stores in the city. You can meet with the cardinal in order to gain useful clergy tiles, each of which gives you a permanent benefit. And you can take decrees from the marquee, giving you bonus wigs at the end of the game. The first thing to do is to simulate the destruction of the city. Take all of the rubble cubes and place them into a bag. Then draw cubes from the bag and place them on the board as follows. Each row and column receives three cubes, apart from the rightmost column which receives two. And two cubes are placed on each public building space. The remaining six cubes are placed just here and will be used later. The blue cubes represent damage from flooding, the red cubes represent damage from fire, and the brown cubes represent damage from the earthquake. In a two-player game, do not use row E, so you will have seven cubes left over, return these to the box. Shuffle the four scoring tiles and place them randomly at the bottom of each street. Place one city tile on each of the coloured spaces on the right side of the board, and place the remaining tiles in stacks next to the display. Take all of the public buildings and make sure they are all the same way up. Shuffle them, and then split them into two equal stacks. Flip one stack over, and then place each stack next to the board adjacent to the corresponding architect. Take the top tile of each stack and place it on the appropriate space. These are the two public buildings which can currently be opened, but you can see the next available building on top of the stack. Separate the plan tiles with the dark blue backs. These will be needed later in the setup. Sort the remaining ones into the blue and green architects, and then sort each stack so that the tile with the fewest officials is on top, and the one with the most officials is on the bottom. Place each stack on the appropriate space next to the public buildings. Place the four price markers on the goods track to denote the current value of each good. These prices will gradually drop during the game and will never increase. Place all the goods next to the board to form a general supply. Place the money here also. Place all of the clergy tiles in a bag, mix them up, and then place six of them face up on the appropriate spaces of the clergy track. Place the cardinal on the space with the influence symbol. Shuffle the decree deck and place it next to the board. Lay out the top eight cards of this deck to form a display of decree cards. Some cards have this icon on them. If playing with two players, remove these cards from the game and replace them as they are drawn. Take the ship cards and separate them by type. Use one fewer card of each type than the number of players, so for a two player game I'm just going to need one of each ship. Stack the blue ships on top of the red ones and place them here. Place the other ships to one side for now, they will not be needed until the second time period of the game. Place the treasury marker on the middle space of the treasury track. Each player takes a player board and sets it up as follows. One of each type of good in your warehouse, five rubble set markers placed here, eight houses here, and eight officials here. You also start the game with ten chreis. Each player places their courtier meeple in the royal court, and one of their markers on space five of the scoring track. Each player also places one of their officials into the office of the Marquis, and only the Marquis. The other offices stay empty for now. 
In a two-player game, you will also place one official from a non-player colour in each of the nobles' offices. Choose a start player and place that player's other disc on space 4 of the influence track. Put the other player's discs on the track so that the second player has 5 influence, the third player has 6, and so on. Each player draws two clergy tiles from the bag at random, chooses one to keep, and puts the other back in the bag. This gives each player a bonus at the start of the game. Each player also receives a random starting plan, the ones with the blue backs that we separated earlier. Place this face up on the appropriate space and return any leftovers to the box. For each player in the game, take one royal favour for each of the three nobles, returning any extras to the box. Mix them up and give one at random to each player, which is placed on the appropriate space of the player board. Stack all other favour tiles in the game on the appropriate noble space. Each player can only ever have one favour from each noble at any one time. Separate the political cards into four decks based on their colour. Shuffle the blue cards and deal five to each player, returning the rest to the box. Once you are experienced with the game, there's a draft variant for these cards. Divide the red cards by the icon on their back, shuffle each set and place them on the appropriate spaces face down. Then flip the top card of each deck face up. The brown and purple cards will not be used until the second time period. One quick thing I forgot to do. Since row E is not used in a two-player game, place one of the city tiles over each of the spaces to cover them up. Before we start, I just wanted to go over a couple of very important things. On your player board you will see that you have a limit of two at the start of the game. This limit applies to your warehouse. You can have two of each good in it. And it also applies to the total number of cards you can have in your portfolio. You will play cards into the top section and bottom section, and your limit is two cards in total. If you want to play a third card, you can discard one that you no longer want. Any rubble cubes you collect during the game go here, on the matching coloured spaces, and once you get one complete set, you move your rubble set cube to the marquee space on the main game board, as he wants to use the rubble from the old ruined buildings in the new city. Your card and warehouse limit has now increased to three, and it increases a further one for each additional set of rubble cubes you collect. During the game you will gain and spend influence. This is recorded on the influence track. There are two special rules about this track. First, whenever you gain influence and you reach space 10, you gain one wig. Remember, wigs are victory points. Your influence cannot go above 10, but if you are at 10 and you gain influence, you still gain the one wig. Also, at any time when you need to spend money, you can move your influence marker left to the next coin icon to gain one real. For example, if I wanted to do something and I was two reais short, I could move my marker to here and then here, giving me the two money I needed. On your turn you perform four steps. The first step is that any ships that you have that are at sea return home. I'll explain ships more later on. The next step is the most important one, and you get to play one of the cards from your hand and perform one of four possible actions. Cards with a picture of a person on them are noble cards, and you can play them into the top part of your portfolio. Doing so triggers the icon on the bottom of the card, which is usually a reward, but in some cases a penalty. In this case, I get one cloth, and then tuck the card under my player board. Alternatively, I could play a treasury card into the bottom of my portfolio instead. Treasure cards are the ones without a picture of a noble on them. Doing this earns me an amount of money equal to the current position of the treasury marker, in this case three, and then the treasury marker moves down one space because I have taken money from the bank. A treasury card in your portfolio gives you a permanent ability. This one, for example, means that I only pay one real for red fire cubes instead of two. Then, if you played a card into your portfolio, either a noble card or a treasury card, you must perform one of the two actions shown here, either sell goods or trade with a noble. I'll explain these actions more later on. Instead of playing a card into your portfolio, you could instead play the card onto the royal court. If you play a noble card to the royal court, place your courtier meeple onto it just to indicate that it's you who played the card. 
you then spend influence to take the action of the noble, which again I'll explain later. If you play a treasury card to the royal court, you pay money equal to the current treasury value to perform the action depicted in the middle of the card. So, to summarise, you can either play a noble card or a treasury card to your portfolio. If you do this, you get to either sell goods or trade with the nobles. Or you could play a card to the royal court, either to visit a noble or sponsor an event. Finally, if you cannot or do not want to do any of these things, you can simply discard a card from your hand and take one gold. This, however, should be a last resort. Once you have performed your actions, you draw a replacement card from one of the piles and then perform your end of turn steps before the next player takes their turn. When you choose this action, you can sell any number of your goods. Each one you sell is moved from your player board to an available space on a ship, owned by you or another player. I'll explain how you build ships later on. For each good, gain an amount of money based on the current market price of that good. This price is modified by the value shown in the top right of the ship, and can be further modified by any cards you have in the bottom half of your portfolio, or any clergy tiles you have. This card, for example, means that each time I sell cloth, I gain an extra two reais. Each ship can hold a number of goods equal to its hull size. The blue ships, for example, can hold one good, the red ships two goods, and so on. When a ship is full, flip all the goods face down. This indicates that the ship is at sea. When a ship sets sail, its owner gains one wig per loaded good on that ship. So when you sell goods to another player's ship, you get the money, but they get the wigs. A ship at sea returns to port at the start of that player's next turn, at which point the face down goods are removed and placed back into the supply. When you trade with the nobles, you can take up to two of the six available state actions. To take a state action, you need to give that noble one of the two goods they desire. The builder wants tools or gold, the marquee wants books or gold, and the king wants cloth or gold. Take one of your goods and place it over the state action you want to perform, and then carry out that action. The six state actions are as follows. Recruit officials. Take two officials from your player board and put them into two different noble offices. You will need nobles in these offices to open public buildings, and also, the presence of your officials increases the influence cost for other players when they visit that noble. If you want to place an official in an office which is full, take one official from each player who has the most in that office and place them into the plaza, and then place your new official in the office. Officials in the plazas can still be used to open public buildings, but they do not increase the influence cost when other players choose to visit that noble. Acquiring a plan. Opening a public building requires a plan from one of the two architects, the green one or the blue one. Remember you start the game with one plan, but to get more you need to take this action. You simply take the top plan from either of the stacks and place it onto your player board. There's no limit to how many plans you can have from both architects. I'll explain more about how plans are used when I cover the public buildings later on. Build a ship. You can build the top ship from the stack by paying a number of different goods equal to the ship's size. So to build this blue ship requires any one good. If you already have a ship, you can also upgrade it to a better ship by paying the difference in goods, but only the ship currently on top of the stack. When you build a ship, play it into the top half of your portfolio. But note the two icons here that you're about to cover up. This one means that the treasury marker moves up one space and this icon means that you gain influence. Total up the influence showing in the cards in your portfolio and move your marker up the influence track accordingly. Include the ship that you've just built. So in this case, I gain four influence. I explained the use of ships earlier on. You and other players can sell goods to them to earn money. Produce goods. This action allows you to produce one good for each store that you have built in the city. Now, I haven't explained building stores in the city yet, but this is definitely something that you're going to be doing during the game. If, for example, I take this action when I have a goldsmith and a bookshop, I gain one gold and one book. And remember, your warehouse limit is based on the number of rubble sets you have collected. 
Whenever goods are produced, the corresponding price markers are reduced by one, no matter how many of that type of good are produced at that moment in time. Meet the Cardinal. The clergy track is in the middle of the game board. When you choose this action, you can move the Cardinal up to two spaces clockwise around the track, moving only onto the empty spaces between the tiles. You may then select one of the clergy tiles adjacent to where he ends up, which you take and place on your player board. These clergy tiles give you a permanent ability as long as you have them, and you can have up to four of them. If the Cardinal lands on or passes the treasury space, move the treasury marker up one space. And if the Cardinal lands on or passes the influence space, each player may choose to give up one or more of their clergy tiles to gain the influence showing in the top section of their portfolio. Giving up a clergy tile in this way earns wigs according to the icons on the back of the tile. This is the only way to earn those wigs, but you lose the tile and its ability. Royal Favour Finally, this action is very simple. Take one of the Royal Favour tokens from any of the nobles that you currently do not have. These favour tokens will allow you to follow another player when they visit a noble, allowing you to take an extra action even when it isn't your turn. When you play a noble card to the royal court, you are visiting that noble. Place your courtier meeple on it as a reminder that it's your turn. This is important because other players can follow you and take actions outside of the normal turn sequence. To visit a noble, you must pay influence equal to the number of other players' officials in the office of that noble, modified by the position of the treasury marker. For example, if I choose to visit the marquee, I have to pay three influence because there are three other officials in his office and then one more because of the position of the treasury marker. When you visit a noble, you may first carry out one of that noble's state actions without having to give him a good. After that, you must carry out the appropriate noble action. If you visit the builder, you can build a store. If you visit the marquee, you can take a decree. And if you visit the king, you can open a public building. After you have done this, each other player may follow you by returning the corresponding favour token to the board. They must also pay influence, but they only get to perform one of the three actions that that noble offers, either the main noble action or one of the two state actions. Now I'll explain the three noble actions. Building a store. As mentioned earlier, building stores during the game is something that you're definitely going to want to do. They will earn you wigs once the appropriate public buildings bring new customers to your stores, and you can also produce goods at your stores which are going to be useful for trading with the nobles or selling to the ships. Take one of the available city tiles from the coloured spaces here. The space you take it from determines which type of store it will be – gold, cloth, books and tools. Then select an empty space in the city that is adjacent to the street matching the type of store you are building. In this case I'm building a cloth store, pink, so I have to select one of the spaces on the pink street. Let's say I choose this one. Take one of the rubble cubes from either the column or the row of that space and place it on your player board. Earn the reward printed on the space which you choose, which here is three influence. You must then pay for the land space and this cost is based on the number of rubble cubes remaining in the column and row, with blue cubes costing one, red cubes costing two, and brown cubes costing three. Add to this cost the current position of the treasury marker. So in my case, I need to pay 15 reais to the bank. And then place the city tile onto the space with the notch facing the appropriate street. Take a wooden house from your player board and place it on the store nearest the street. When taking a house from your player board, you must choose the lowest one from one of the three columns. Removing houses from certain spaces on your player board unlocks special abilities. This one allows you to spend money instead of influence when visiting a noble. This one means that building a ship costs you one good fewer than normal. And this one means that building a ship is free. This one means that when you produce goods, you get one more of a type you produced. And this one means that when you produce goods, you get one more of each type that you've produced. Building a store does not earn you any wigs immediately unless there is an appropriate public building already opened in the same column or row that matches the colour of your store. I'll explain public buildings a lot more later on, but 
Let's say, for example, this public building had already been opened here. It's in the same street as my new store. There's also a public building in the same row. However, there's no pink showing on that building, so it doesn't count. I then look at the scoring tile at the bottom of the column, and that's how many wigs I earn. If that second public building was this one instead, then there would have been two relevant public buildings, and I would have scored six wigs instead of three. Even if you don't earn any wigs upon immediately building the store, you will earn wigs later in the game once the appropriate public buildings are opened. Taking a decree. The main action of the marquee allows you to take one of the decree cards currently on display and place it next to your player board. Decrees will earn you bonus wigs at the end of the game, based on the criteria shown on the card. When you choose this action, if you have any rubble set cubes on the marquee, you may discard one of them to take one additional decree card. There is no limit to how many decree cards you can collect during the game. Opening a public building. As we saw earlier, public buildings determine which stores are going to earn wigs. You can only open one of the two public buildings currently on display, and to do so, you must have a plan tile of the appropriate architect. Select one of your plan tiles and then take the matching public building. Choose a space on where to place it. A public building can be placed on any of the rows, no matter what the colours on it, but to place it in a column, it has to have the colour showing for the street. This building, for example, can be placed on any of the rows, but only this column or this one. Let's say I decide to place it here. Take the rubble cubes on the space and place them on your player board. Then receive the bonus shown on the space where you're placing the building. You must then return a number of officials from the nobles offices and or plazas back to your player board equal to the amount showing on the architect's plan that you're using. If you don't have enough officials, you can hire the rest, paying an amount of money for each, equal to the current treasury value. Then, flip the used plan face down here. When a public building is opened on one of the streets, all players with stores on that street now earn wigs based on the scoring tile at the bottom of the appropriate column. So in this example, purple would score three wigs and green would score four. This store would not score because it's a bookstore, with the entrance on the brown street. When a public building is opened on one of the rows, players with stores in that row that match a colour shown on the public building now earn wigs. So again, in this example, purple would score three wigs for this store, but would not earn any wigs for this store because it's a bookstore and not a cloth store. Each store can score a maximum of three times during the game, because there's one public building to the north, one to the west and one to the east. If you play a treasury card to the royal court, you can perform the action or receive the reward shown in the middle of the card. To do this, you must pay an amount of money equal to the current position of the treasury marker. When you sponsor an event in this way, no other player can follow you. That only applies when you're visiting a noble. Once your action is complete, you take the top card from one of the four piles and add it to your hand. Then, reveal the next card from that pile. Refill the city display, refill the clergy display, refill the decrees, and remove the goods from any state actions. The next player can then take their turn. As soon as any player completes their second set of rubble, or three political card decks in the display are empty, then at the end of the current player's turn, you end the first period. Each player earns three wigs for each set of rubble cubes on their player board, then discard any ship cards remaining in the shipyard and replace them with the purple and brown ships, with the purple ones on top. Each player may then discard any number of cards from their hand. For each type of noble card you discard, you may earn the reward printed on the bottom of the card. So, if I choose to discard these four cards, I can take this reward and then either this one or this one, because these two cards are the same noble. Discarding a treasury card does not get you any reward. Each player then draws back up to a hand size of 5 with cards from the purple political deck. Finally, prepare the brown political cards in the same way as the red cards were done during setup. Then continue to play with the next player in turn order. 
The game ends when one player has completed their fourth set of rubble cubes, or again, three political card decks in the display are empty. At this point though, you play until the end of the round, so that all players have had the same number of turns. Then you play one more round, and then the game ends. You score wigs according to the hull size of the ships in your portfolio. Three wigs for each set of rubble cubes, and then you score more wigs based on how many of each type of store you have. This is shown in the coloured sections, so for example the player with the most bookstores earns nine wigs, second most six, and third most three. In a two player game you will only score the first and third places. Score wigs for all of your decree cards if you meet the criteria, then convert any remaining influence into money, and gain one wig for each five hreais that you have. Score wigs for having put more public officials to work than the other players. This is shown here. Again, in a two player game, just use the 15 and the 5. And finally, two wigs for each royal favour you still have. The player with the most wigs at the end of the game wins. I hope you found this video useful in learning how to play Lisboa. For more of my videos, please check out my YouTube channel and subscribe. Take care, and thanks for watching.